It's like saying that aliens are like us, but maybe they have pointy ears or maybe they have fuzzy foreheads, <laughs> right? It's a mistake we've made a lot in assuming that our experience is somehow important or central to the universe mm. and assuming that the way humans do physics and do science and think about the universe is the only way. It's sort of like geocentrism, right? It's just an assumption and it might be wrong. Can we imagine, even if it sounds implausible, ways alien could be Aliens could be quite alien. Daniel, let's uh, cover some of the themes of your book, Do Aliens Speak Physics, which I love. Uh, let's start with the Drake Equation, which um, many people are familiar with, but go through it in technical detail. Some of the terms that are multiplied to get together to give a sense of the likelihood of different kinds of life in the universe. Yeah, so the Drake equation is sort of misleadingly simple. It's just a bunch of numbers multiplied together. So it doesn't look as complicated as the Schrodinger equation or something, but there's a power to this simplicity. It's a way to calculate the number of alien civilizations that might be out there that we could potentially communicate with. And the structure of the equation, just multiplying numbers together, tells us something important. Each term in the equation tells us the fraction of, for example, stars that have planets, or the fraction of those planets that have life, or the fraction of those planets with life that develop civilizations. And the multiplication of it tells you that if any of those numbers are zero, the whole thing is zero. So in order to have intelligent aliens out there that can communicate with us, you need everything to line up. You need there to be enough stars, enough planets, enough life, enough civilizations, enough technological civilizations that exist at the right time. If any of those numbers are zero, it's impossible for us to communicate with intelligent aliens. Okay, and different people have different ideas about the, the order of magnitude of, of each of them. I, I've talked mm -hmm. to some, for example, um, evolutionary biologists, who, who's some very well known ones, who would say that the, the critical number is not from non-life to life, but from life to intelligent life mm -hmm. as we know it. And a few of them would put that number close to zero, if not zero. Yeah. And, and I'm I'm only bringing that up uh, because it, just different people with a different foci would pick a different place. Now, for example, in the number of planets per star, which when Frank Drake originally did it, he had no idea. Yeah. But since then, we have real data uh, yeah, that's, that's very substantial that would seem to indicate, at least on average, at least one planet for every star. Mm -hmm. and, probably a lot more and then maybe a, a a pretty high fraction of those or or some fraction would be in the habitable zone the goldilocks zone so that's one term that we have data on uh, since then exactly and that's very exciting that we start with a huge number of stars and now we know a huge number of planets right that's very new information to us as a species and yet we still don't know what the next terms are the next terms could be one right. over a quadrillion or they could right. be one over two right and the consequences are incredible but if any of those numbers are zero it doesn't matter how many stars and planets yeah, are out there, right right right, right? And so that's one, one zero in a multiplication list you are at zero <laughs> you don't need to worry about the other terms uh, exactly. you, you add a couple at, what was frank frank's drake's last um a term in his equation i think the last term for him is the number of those civilizations that develop technology okay and and you have you have an extension of that mm -hmm. and and it it informs the book a lot and really gives a lot of new ideas in the book which which again i love so what are some of your additions to that yeah well to me the equation is about answering the big question are we alone in the universe and, you know, because we're not just interested in are there slime molds on alien planets, we want to communicate with the aliens, we want to find aliens that are like us, that are intelligent. But I want to go further than that. I want to find aliens that are curious about the universe and want to understand it. I want to find aliens that are curious about the same questions and would be capable of accepting the same answers as us. And so I added some terms to this Drake equation to try to calculate what fraction, uh, you know, what are there aliens out there? There that we could actually talk physics with. And so I added a term, which is number one, what fraction of intelligent species actually do science, are actually scientific? 
Um, and another one is, could we communicate with them? Could we actually map our ideas uh, to theirs somehow? Uh, another term is, do they ask the same questions? Are they interested in the same topics as us? And the last one is, could we share answers? Are we in the same place on our scientific journey? Is there just one path? Is there just one answer? Um, is it even possible to find a coherent answer? And are we smart enough to, to understand their answers if they do share them? Because if any of those numbers are zero, then we can't satisfy my personal scientific fantasy, which is meeting advanced aliens and benefiting from their millions or billions of years of scientific thought. So your additional terms, you mentioned four, which are specific chapters in the book, which are great. Mm -hmm. Those reduce Frank's final number, whatever yeah. they are, unless all four are one, yeah. they, they, they effectively reduce the, the, the answer. And it's, it's actually a good way to understand the equation when you add mm -hmm. the extra terms and realize yeah. you're getting smaller and smaller and smaller because you're, as long as you're multiplying by something less than one, it can be yeah. nine, but that's still reducing the number. Exactly. And I think that's an important point because these are things I think instinctively people assume are one. Yes, of course, intelligent technological aliens, aliens must do science, or of course we could communicate with them, or of course they're going to be interested in the same stuff or that we could understand their answers. Your knee-jerk response is to say that these numbers are probably one. But I think that that's an extrapolation from our experience. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, It's like saying that aliens are like us, but maybe they have pointy ears or maybe they have fuzzy foreheads, <laughs> right? It's a mistake we've made a lot in assuming that our experience is somehow important or central to the universe mm. and assuming that the way humans do physics and do science and think about the universe is the only way is sort of like geocentrism right it's just an assumption and it might be wrong and so the book essentially is asking do we know whether these numbers are one or can we imagine even if it sounds implausible ways alien could be aliens could be quite alien. And so the book is an exercise in digging into those numbers and trying to understand what we can say about them. Yeah. And that's great. One, uh, one point that is uh, initially counterintuitive, but when you think mm -hmm. about it in the examples you gave, it, it, it be, becomes very realistic is can you do technology without science? And exactly. when I first see that, the answer is obviously no. But then you have some wonderful example, building the pyramids, beer, bread, yogurt, mm -hmm. and cheese. <laughs> those, those are your examples, if I remembered correctly. And, and, and those are very specific technologies. Mm -hmm. And they had no idea what the science was. Exactly. Exactly. And when you hear the idea that aliens have arrived and they've landed in Central Park with their warp ships, you might think, OK, of course, now we can understand questions of like quantum gravity. They must understand these things. But that's an assumption that aliens have something in common with us, a curiosity. Because, you know, behind the technology might be an understanding. It might be that they have also wondered, why does this thing we've built work? How does it work? And, and of course, we know that developing that understanding accelerates your technology. Look at the development of technology in, in humanity. You know, once we develop empirical science and an understanding of these things, it obviously informs us. We don't have to do like a random search through technology space. But before we had science, we definitely had technology, as you say. You know, another great example is metallurgy. People figured out how to make steel and then like super fancy sword steel with all sorts of folds. This relies on nanotechnology and advanced like quantum mechanical condensed matter physics to understand why it works. Swordsmiths in India and in Japan had no idea why they were dunking into water and then dipping it in ash and all sorts of stuff. They didn't understand the structure of what they were doing. It just worked. It was a recipe. And even today, a lot of people, they go in the kitchen, they want to make a souffle. They don't care about the food chemistry. They're not going to understand it. They don't want to. They just want to know, what do I put in and when and how, and so that I can eat something delicious. <laughs> and so in the book, I imagine, well, what if there's an alien race out there that's just technological, that never figured this stuff out? They just know how to build a warp drive. And when we ask them, yeah, well, how does it work? They'd be like, what do you mean? Here it is. <laughs> and we can show you how to make another one. Why do you care? <laughs> For me, the fundamental question is, how does the universe work? Yes, I want a warp drive, but I also want to know why that warp drive works. But that's emotional. That's personal. That's human. And I don't know that aliens will feel the same way. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. 
You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing. Closer to Truth is now accepting your tax-exempt donations. Please come to closertotruth.com forward slash donate. Thank you very much for supporting us and thanks for watching.